Good evening, everyone. My name is Vanha. So thank you, Denise. Thank you, CDC, for inviting me to do this talk. Um, yeah, it's probably a bit of an unusual choice for a person to speak. I usually just teach maths. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk. Uh, that's my name in Chinese because um, when you write it out in Ro Romanized uh, language, you do not realize that my name has a number. But when you write it out in Chinese, uh, you can see. I actually prefer the traditional version. Looks nicer. <laughs> the, the simplified version look a bit lopsided because there are so few strokes in the first two. And then the last one is so, so involved. You see why I don't study Chinese, Mandarin Chinese as a child? My name is so difficult to write. <laughs> That's the first thing they'll make you do in a Chinese class. And imagine as a primary one child, you have to write those strokes. That's quite difficult, isn't it? Those are some of the places I've been to. <laughs> Which one do you want to know? <laughs> They're all quite nice places. Which one you do not know? <laughs> Guernsey is um, off the coast of England. It's quite near Spain. You will see this character throughout today. He's called Spikey. He's quite well known. He even has his own stem. I will tell you the story in six chapters. Chapter zero. An irritating annual phenomena. And it's not the haze. What is it? Not the PSLE. But people getting upset over PSLE. Right? Parents upset as PSLE maths paper leave. Pupils in tears. When I was taking PSLE, my mothers were in tears. <laughs> Not because of the PSLE, but because I came to Singapore all by myself. I was born in Penang. Um, yeah, I was, I was in Singapore all by myself. This is a maths class, so you're going to do some maths. <laughs> Talk to people around you, how would you solve that problem? All right? Two minutes, over to you. Talk to your friends, this is a maths class. <laughs> maths class cannot be quiet. If it's quiet, it's suspicious. Do you manage to do it? Can you imagine all the semicircles move to the left? Can you imagine all the semicircles move to the left? The one on top all squashed to the left? Where would all the 12 go to? Can you imagine the semicircles on the bottom all go to the left? Where would all the three numbers go to? So do you see all the semicircles piling up to the left? Then in the end, do you see 24? And then the two semicircles at the bottom pile to the left. Do you see the 22, the 16, the 22? All go to the right. So do you see the difference? So it's not difficult. Another way to look at it is, the top is how many diameter? Together with 24, right? The bottom is how many diameters? Together with 22, 16, and 22. That's 44 and 16. That's 60. So the difference is 60 and 24, right? Why is there a difference? Yeah, because of the extra diameter. 
So the extra diameter must be the rest of it. 60 take away 24. Not so hard, right? This type of problem, you can solve it either using visualization, the first way, or using logical thinking, the way we just did it. The top part is 3 diameters and 24. The bottom part is 2 diameters and 60. Maybe this one is harder. You want to give it a go? You got no choice. It's a maths class. <laughs> Two minutes, just talk about it, all right? Uh, in the learning of maths, you've got to talk. You don't talk, it's very hard to learn it, yeah? So the question is, uh, basically, how many white triangles and how many grey triangles in figure 250? I mean, that's the main one. The rest are not so difficult. Yeah. So in figure 250, how many grey and how many white triangles is essentially what the question is. All right, two minutes, just talk to people around you. Do you see a pattern? What do you notice? Look at figure one, the total. One. Figure two, total is four. Figure three, total is nine. Figure four, total is 16. Four times four. So figure one is one times one. Figure two is two times two. Figure three, three times three. So figure four, four times four, figure five, five times five. So figure 250, just 250 times 250. They have calculator for this paper. So it's not so difficult. But of course, that's not it. Next. What else do you notice? One and zero. One and three. Six and three. What do you notice about the difference? One and zero. Figure one, one and zero. Figure two, one and three. What's the difference? Figure three, six and three. Figure four, what's the difference? Figure five, what's the difference? Figure 250, what's the difference? So the difference between the difference between the two numbers is 250. So whatever the number is for one, the difference is 250. And the total we know that it is 250 times 250. But you also notice something. Do you notice something? The first one, which one is more? White is more. Second one, gray is more. Next one, white is more. So when is white is more? The figure number is odd, right? But 250 is even. So even should be Gray more or white more? More gray, right? So, gray must be the one that's the greater number, and white must be the one that is a smaller number. So, from there, it's not so difficult already because once you do the calculation, you subtract away the 250, it's gone. You're left with two equal parts. So, you divide by two. You get the answer to this. Once you know the answer to that, you know the answer to the grey one, which is essentially the, the question itself. It's difficult if people cannot see pattern. It's difficult if the first question, 
people cannot visualize. Visualizing and looking for patterns are the two most basic things in mathematics. So this is, this is what I often do uh, with teachers around the world. I try to send a message and to teach them the know-how. This is what I usually do when I, 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 I do classes for teachers around the world. So many teachers do not have the necessary know-how in different parts of the world. What is it that we need to teach? How do we teach it? So <laughs> a lot of people who are familiar with me think that I, I, I mostly spend my time posing for photographs because that's all you see in the social media about me, taking photographs with my uh, students, class participants. Uh, if you notice, those two ladies are wearing a shirt that has my name on it. It's something I always say. A quiet math class is suspicious. You have to talk when you learn mathematics. You cannot do mathematics quietly. If you learn mathematics quietly, then you cannot learn it at the highest level. And then maybe you cannot do the PSLE question. <laughs> and apparently in some schools, they have this thing called wall of selfies, where you know teachers who attend courses take photographs and then put it up, and apparently I'm in one of them. If you think all, the, all my students are ladies, uh, it's not the case. Some of them are young children. Uh, very often when I do classes, I teach young children as well. Uh, part of the course will involve me working with actual children. Uh, that's a model that I have developed in teacher training. In other words, teacher training must always include teachers observing students doing the actual learning. So these are my collaborators really, my co-teachers. So they help me teach the class by being students in the classes that I teach to adult teachers. Uh, those above, they are from Holland, a bunch of rather gifted students in grade five, primary five. Um, and Holland, they all speak English, so not a problem, especially the more able ones, they do speak very good English, so it's not a problem at all. Uh, the three group of students are from, uh, if you like, a neighborhood school in Hawaii. Yeah, in, in a rather poor area, in the Nanakuli area. So they usually come from homes that are slightly deprived. Um, but nevertheless, they're capable of learning. Definitely capable of learning. And they, again, are my collaborators during the courses. They, they turn up and then I, I do lessons with them. And afterwards, their teachers uh, will discuss whatever that they observe. These are some of my other students. Not a small one. The small one is a child of one of my students. Uh, in some countries, they come with their children because they have no babysitter, so they just bring their kids along. And then I do the easy thing, just carry the kid and take photographs. <laughs> Things are getting a bit out of hand. It looks a bit creepy, actually. It's taller than I am. Not very hard. But the thing is taller than I am. So uh, I think these are Philippines where they have this standy, <laughs> whenever I'm not around, they put it out and then people take photographs with it. It's a bit strange. The know-how. What do adults need to know about the learning of mathematics? Actually, there are only so many things students need to learn in mathematics. Five. P1 to P6, SEC4, JC2, you only need to be good at five things. It's impossible not to learn them, right? Question is, do, do adults, do parents focus on the five things? Do teachers have enough expertise to teach the five things? The five things I mentioned already, Visualization. The mind's ability to see beyond what the eyes can see is a very important part of doing mathematics. 
That means the, the mind can see how the semicircles all move to the left, pushing the 24 to the, to the right, and how the three semicircles at, at the bottom part all get pushed to the left, pushing the three numbers to the right, giving you a total of 60. I mean, the 60 is not difficult to get. Just a little computation. But the visualization is the one that's hard. The calculation is not difficult. 12 and 12. And then the three numbers added together. And then subtracting 60 and 24. The actual calculation is almost like P1 level. But the difficult bit that make a problem difficult, whether it's PSLE or not, in mathematics, is ability to visualize. Many people get sabotaged by the inability to visualize. Many parents unknowingly focus on the, the calculations. They make the students do a lot of calculations because they think that mathematics is calculation. But actually, mathematics is not about calculation. Calculation can be done by machines. You don't even need a brain to do calculation. Like my, my iPhone that doesn't have a brain, I hope not, <laughs> can do computation. The second ability is the ability to generalize, to be able to see a pattern and then generalize it. Like the way we did, figure one, total is one times one. Figure two, total is two times two. From there, you begin to inductively speculate that figure three could be that, figure four could be that, and so on. And then you generalize. The calculation in this case, 250 by 250, of course, it's a bit tedious, but it's not difficult. In any case, you've got a calculator to do it. But if you cannot see it, then no matter what calculation you can do, it's, it's a waste of time. You, you need to see the 250 times 250 before you can even calculate it. What else is important in mathematics? Number sense. So when we saw a while ago, uh, you, you begin to realize that, oh, one, four, nine, you begin to have a feeling there's something special about that number because of your previous exposure. When you look at the difference in the number, one and zero, and then one and three, and so on, you begin to notice that, oh, the difference. Isn't the difference interesting? That the difference changes from one to two, to three to four, to five, but the change is not a, a clear-cut change. Because it, it toggles, it flips. Sometimes gray more, sometimes white more. But number sense is your ability to detect things like that. What else is important? This thing that psychologists call metacognition, the brain's ability to monitor a complex process, and finally, communication. After all, mathematics is a language. So if students cannot read mathematical sentences, then, then of course it's going to be difficult. Let me demonstrate what, what I mean by that. Here you see students learning mathematics. They must engage in six different experiences if they are to do well. What are they? They must have a chance to just do it by themselves first. For you to see what they don't know and what they know. If you go in straight and try to teach something, you do not actually know how to help them because you have no previous experience how they are thinking about that topic or that prob problem. Uh, educational theories call that stage exploration. Exploration is an important part an important experience in learning mathematics. Other than exploration, what else is important? Structured learning. You cannot just explore, 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 and explore. Sometimes you hear people talk about exploratory approaches versus teacher-directed approaches, as if it's dichotomous. That's not true. You need both. You need to have structured learning followed by exploration. And then, of course, you need practice. I think that one everybody knows. 
but many people do not know that there's a difference between drill and practice. Practice is not repetition. Practice is variation. If you do the same thing again and again and again, that's not really practice. It's a drill. Yeah? A good practice is variation. What else is important as an experience other than exploration, structured learning, and practice? What else is important would be journaling. Here you see the students on the top right writing a maths journal. It's nothing new. You and I who went to school 100 years ago used to have a, a notebook where we write stuff either to describe or to reflect or to extend or to investigate something. Not just filling in the blanks. We are not bringing up a generation of form fillers. They must be able to write the entire process all by themselves. Here you see the boy doing that, half a page already. What else must they have as an experience? Reading. Mathematics is a language. Of course you need to read when you, when you learn a language. Here you see the two girls trying to read how the friends in the book have solved the problem and try to explain their way of thinking. Finally, reflection. So exploration, structured learning, practicing. Other than that, journal writing. Reflection. And one more missing is reading. Here you see some examples of journals written by children in England. Three Bridges Primary School is in London, England. The teachers have been trained uh, using this method that I teach in the class, which is not my method really. It's based on learning theories. It's based on what we already know, the, the know-how. So, so you see that they, they write quite ex extensively. In this particular journal, they were asked to pinpoint where their teacher went wrong. Their teacher is um, Mr. O'Connell. He's, uh, he's David. He's, he's one of the teachers who have attended the training for a long time now and has been teaching it for a while and truly believe that this is the way to do it because he can see the changes in his students from before when they were using a different way of doing things, the so-called traditional way, to this particular way, he see a big difference. And, and of course, not just a big difference in the attitude, the, the interest, but also in the actual result itself. So it's not just like doing worksheet, filling up forms. It's actual thinking. Like here's, a, here's a piece you need to write. Your friend Hana needs help. She cannot work out 213 times 32. Can you help her? Remember to fully explain each step of your answer. So it's not just calculating. It's thinking. It's trying to express your thoughts. And that's one important part of learning mathematics. This is from a different school. Our Lady of PT Primary School, somewhere near Liverpool, in Viral, England. And here you see younger students trying to present different ways, different methods uh, to, to multiply 3 and 8 to find a product of 4 and 8, which of course we read as 3 groups of 8 or 4 rows of 8. So journal writing is pretty important. The ability to write, the ability to read is so critical in the doing of mathematics. Let's look at one example. I mean, something you do in secondary school. Probably sec 1 or sec 2. You have to solve an equation. The difference between this number and that number is 2. The difference between this and that is 2. What must this number be? You see how easy it is? You said that number got to be 3. No nonsense like negative 1. You move to the right-hand side. It becomes positive 1. Of course, you get the answer. 
but by applying a rule that you may not know why. When the actual reasoning is so straightforward, the difference between two numbers is two. The difference between that number and one is two. Even P1 students can do that. They learn that in P1. They do that in P1. They do. And that is exactly what the problem is. The difference between two numbers is two. The difference between a number and one is two. But you must read it. You, you do not spell it. What is spelling? Spelling is like that. 6 over 2x minus 1, minus 1, equals to 2. You did not do anything except to make noise. What I just did was to make noise. When I said 6 over 2x minus 1, minus 1, equals to 2. I didn't say anything meaningful. But if I say the difference between this number and 1 is 2, I'm saying something. Can you imagine reading a storybook, Harry Potter, by spelling every single word? How much can you enjoy? How much can you comprehend? Probably not much. Next. When you first learn dividing, you can write it many ways. Some parts of the world write it like that but not, not so common in Singapore. It's a bit too high for you. I think this is common. This is pretty common. Uh, this is common in continental Europe and Latin America. But uh, all these are the same, same symbol, dividing. If you say 6 divided by 2, you actually do not know the meaning. What's the meaning of 6 divided by 2? 6, share between 2, right? So that's the first meaning. Second meaning, 6, put into groups of 2's. That is also written as this, or, or this, or, or this. 6, how many twos? Sorry. Six. How many twos? Totally different meaning, as you can see from the picture. If you say six divided by two, if you spell it, the meaning doesn't come out across clearly. But when you say it, the red meaning, six put into two equal groups. Six share between two. The green meaning, Six, how many twos? Now I ask you, one, how many halves? If you write it down, it's like that. One, how many halves? Two. It's very easy. No, no need nonsense like one divided by fraction. Boys and girls, remember. Yeah. When you divide by a fraction, remember, the one you change to times. Yeah, then the, the half, you tabale the thing. <laughs> tabale is English for invert. Then you cross your life away. All that trouble for something so simple. In one, how many thirds? Three. It's very easy. The third meaning. The third meaning for 6 divided by 2 is 6 compared to 2. How many times? 6 compared to 2. How many times? 3 times. All return the same. 6 compared to 2. 3 times. 6 compared to 2. 3 times. Alright? If you can read all that, Then the problem we have is not so difficult. Six compared to a number, how many times? Six compared to this number, three times. 
six compared to a number three times. What is that number? Not hard, right? So you say, that number has a value of two. No need complicated things like, oh, you stick in over one here, then you cross multiply like a butterfly. I mean, you get the answer, but why all that trouble? When you can read, a lot of things are possible. A lot of people cannot do mathematics because they cannot read. The moment you cannot read, even something very easy can become very complicated. Right? Like, I do not know Russian. I, I often go to Russia for the World Bank project. Nothing sinister. <laughs> Education. Um, and in Russia, they do not label all their public toilets using symbols. Sometimes they write in the Russian alphabet, which is a different alphabet altogether. Not even our ABC is a different alphabet system. Uh, I cannot read Russian at all. So for me to go to the correct toilet in a shopping mall without getting into trouble, all of a sudden become quite difficult just because I cannot read. A lot of people do not, a lot of people cannot do mathematics well, not because it's hard, not because they're not smart, but because they do not know the language. Do we as adults read to them? Or do we spell at them? The more we spell at them, the less will be the understanding. So there's a bunch of theories that allow us to understand how people learn mathematics. Brunner's theory says that you always begin with concrete experiences. Afterwards, you use pictorial representation. Then and only then can you learn the abstract. You cannot begin with the symbols. You must always begin with something concrete and then something pictorial. So to learn 2x equals to 6, you cannot start with 2x equals to 6. You might begin with pictorial. Let this be x. Let that be x. That's equal to 6. From there, it's quite easy to see uh, what we need to do to find the value of x. Another theory reminds us that you must always begin with exploration before structured learning. And afterwards, practice. That's Zoltan Dean's theory. What I'm trying to say is, we actually know how to make everyone learn mathematics well. We actually know. But do we use them? Do we train professionals who need to use them? Use them. We actually know. Not yesterday, not last week, not last year. The first theory by Brunner has been around since the 60s. Uh, so it's the second theory by Zoltan Deans. What else do we need to know? We need to know that reflection is critical. That's from John Dewey. John Dewey was born in the 1800s. So it's not a, a new theory. John Dewey's theory basically say that we do not learn by doing. We learn by reflecting upon what we have done. So the doing is okay. It's necessary, but not a sufficient condition for learning to take place. So we actually know quite a lot about how people can learn mathematics. Another theory by Vygotsky say that interaction is important. You do not interact, your learning is limited by a glass ceiling. So interaction is quite critical. You separate the children, they will not really learn very well. You need to help them interact. Of course, some people have issues with interaction, so we need to teach them interaction first so they can benefit more. Otherwise, their learning will be limited. Finally, Piaget, the guy, not the watch, uh, say that the spoken language is quite important. You must talk when you learn mathematics. You must not use formal terms all the time. You must talk using your plain language. 
Because when you use plain language, it's a bit of a struggle. Because you try to capture the essence of something so precise using your imprecise language of a child. So it is a struggle. It is a struggle. And that struggle defines learning. You don't struggle, you don't learn. You always need a bit of struggle. The message we are trying to help colleagues around the world really understand is this, that everyone can learn mathematics as long as we teach them the correct what using the correct how. Sadly, many people still believe that mathematics learning is somewhat inherited. Like, oh, my parents not good at maths, so I'm also not good at maths. That's nonsense. You can inherit bad looks. You cannot inherit bad maths. <laughs> Mathematical ability is predominantly opportunities and negligibly genetic. The role of genetics plays so little that it doesn't contribute much in the actual performance of a child. So that's the main message. So that's what I really do when I go and do classes around the world. I try to help as many adults as possible, usually teachers, but sometimes parents too, to understand the know-how and to get the right message, to teach them the what, what do children need to learn, the five things, visualizing and generalizing and whatnot. And how do we help them learn the various learning theories? That's really what I do when I go from country to country. Not not a difficult job, really. Especially when colleagues are enthusiastic about what they hear. And I usually spend three days with them in a complete course. And some places it's only a day. So we do with whatever the time we are given. But usually after three days hanging out with me, uh, we can get them to be a bit excited about teaching and learning uh, in the way that we know. From, from learning theories. Um, a lot of people think that I do very well in school. I do. It's not because I'm smart. It's because before I went to primary school, I was well prepared. Oh no, I didn't go to kindergarten. I did not. Uh, my mother asked me before enrollment, do you want to go to kindergarten? I said no. That was the end of the story. So I didn't go to kindergarten. My first day of school was wearing a school uniform to go to primary school in Penang. I didn't go to kindergarten. So I got a lot of time to play, obviously. Um, from my research, we have found out that a lot of preparation happened before they come to primary one. Children who thrive in primary school, they actually get Quite good preparation. So what are those preparations? Let me share some of them with you. Huh, that's me. No, not the tall one. That's my brother. <laughs> that was his first pair of long pants. He's in primary six. He was in primary six. Um, he, was six he is still six years older than I am. He was, but still is. So I, I was six years old. That was the year before... I went to primary one. So I was supposed to be at kindergarten. That, is, that was my father's car. Uh, mini minor? Yeah. Brown color, you cannot tell from here. That's how shy I was. I was painfully shy. Just looking at the camera is unbearable. I was that shy. So obviously school will not be a good place for me. Teaching will not be a good job for me. Speaking to foreign teachers, sometimes in the hundreds, who are strangers to me, would not be good for me. But we can learn anything, of course. Uh, who were my first teachers? My father and my mother. People will never forget how you make them feel. A quote from Maya Angelou. 
I can remember as far back as a few months old. My neighbor, the mother-in-law of Uncle Maniam, uh, we stayed in fire station because my father was a fireman. Um, and the, one of the neighbors is uh, Uncle Maniam. And the mother-in-law, every morning, would pick me up and bring me to their home. And I remember distinctly sitting on the kitchen counter. Because I couldn't walk yet. I must only be a few months old because I walked when I was 10 months old. So that was, yeah, before I was 10 months. I think I could remember it because I felt the love that the grandma had for me. Every morning, picking me up, putting me there, and feeding me tose. <laughs> so I love tose. The, the sour, the sourish taste. Uh, unfortunately, after a while, that didn't happen. Uh, she passed away. But it wasn't until much later uh, that I knew that she passed away because I walked past the house, I peeked into the house, and I saw a little shrine with her photograph. I must be like maybe three years old, that age, that time. So I, I realized, oh, she died. And that's my first encounter with death. And it, and to me, it's like something natural. As a child, I thought, oh, it's, it's maybe like everyone would die anyway. So I didn't, I felt sad, but not, not, not so sad that I couldn't function. Uh, but yeah, I did feel sad. Uh, that is the first photobomb before photobomb was popular. That's our house cat. Uh, her name is Mimi. Do you see <laughs> at the background, photobombing? when we're taking the portrait. That's all the children. If you can pick me out. Uh, that's my father, not me. I look like him. But I'm one of the small ones. Um, we live in Fire Station. My first two languages were Penang Hokkien and Penang Malay. None of which is useful for formal schooling <laughs> because they use standard Malay, they use standard English, they use Mandarin. I have no language when I first went to school. But apparently it's okay. Apparently, if you learn one language at least very well at the native speaker's level, your brain would have been grown to a level where you can pick up any other languages. Today I learned, I know quite a lot of languages. I did not know English the first day of school. But I spoke Malay at the native level because all my neighbors were Malays. But it's quite nice living in a fire station. You get to roam around. You get to go to the fire engine, climb up the fire engine. That's my father in my PhD robe. My father is a bit uh, silly. He likes to do things like that. Yeah, he's, he's quite a nice person. He, he will fit very well in today's world. He's the kind who will brag on the internet. I'm so proud of you, son. My mother wouldn't do such a thing. But he will fit very well in today's world when you go to the Facebook and brag about your own children. Well done. I mean, today is kind of the norm. People do that all the time. But you know, in my father's generation, that's a bit embarrassing. How can you praise your own child? It's like, come on, he's your own child. You shouldn't praise him. But my father was like that. Um, I think I learned a lot because he read a lot. He read newspaper, he read books. I couldn't read, but I would take the newspaper and copy out the sentences on the bond paper that he brought home. Okay, you're so young, you don't know what a bond paper is. Typewriting paper. Bond brand. I still remember the brand, even though I couldn't read back then because he bring it back. So often, I remember the spelling, B-O-N-D in capital letters. And I, I practice writing, copying out sentences. I think I learned a lot. Um, that's his book that still exists today, printed in 1930s. Uh, my parents were not rich, but we were not made to feel poor. We actually have a set of encyclopedia at home. They must have paid in installments. I spent all my days before primary one reading those encyclopedias. 
I couldn't read. <laughs> but apparently, reading can happen before you can read. Look at the pictures. You make stories up for the pictures, for the words you cannot read. That apparently is quite important as a way of learning. Apparently, if you start reading by reading, you lose something. I remember doing this. I, I drew a cup on a piece of paper. But because I was so young, I couldn't cut it out. And I remember interrupting my father to ask him to cut for me. He didn't ask me why. He knew why. But he just did it anyway. I was going to put sand into this cup. Come on, I was two years old. But I remember it. I remember him not laughing at me. On hindsight, such a silly thing. But I remember he just did it. I remember him not losing his temper or being angry because he was having gas at home. But, and I interrupted him like, I want it to be cut because I want to pour sand into it. And I remember the distinctive feel of disappointment when the sand couldn't go into the cup. I remember it. My mother did not go to school because poverty, uh, no parents, Second World War, combination of those. Uh, but she's an intelligent woman, clearly, uh, very intelligent. And I think I learned a lot from her, just observing what she, she does. She's pretty capable. By the time they had four children, my last sisters came along. Uh, my father's small salary wasn't enough anymore. Uh, she started her own uh, food business, running canteens in construction site. And I was in afternoon school. In the morning, I helped her. I, I think I learned a whole lot of things just helping her run a canteen. I remember one incident where I was helping my mother with her food business. Uh, every Chinese New Year, on the ninth day, it's called Pai Ting Kong. Pai Ting Kong is when we pray to the, that, that guy up there. <laughs> and Ang Ku Kui is like a, a thing that people buy. And, and she makes them and sells them. And I help her. I help her uh, by bathing the Ang Ku Kui. You must remove the flower. Otherwise, the, the design is, is not nice. And then you must kind of shine it. Just like put a layer of cooking oil on top. So it looked really, really, really nice. Um, I did that. And a neighbor came around. And my mother, my mother said for the very first time, Ban Ha is a good boy. He helped me. That was, and still is, the only time she praised me <laughs> within my earshot. And I remember it. Because I felt so proud that I did a good job that earned her praise. That's our mother. You can tell that she has a veto power in everything we do. Uh, the four of us let her decide whatever she wants to do. She can say whatever and we'll just say yes. Um, we are very close as a family. Uh, we lost our father 10 years ago, 2010, unfortunately. After that, we begin to value her a lot more, and hence all these photographs. Uh, we just like um, to be around her. Um, that's the four of us when we were younger. <laughs> I was at university. A lot of children's learning come from home. A lot of children's education actually is at home. When the education at home is well done, you go to school, everything is easy going. Largely. I'm talking about people who have no specific difficulties. Yeah? Of course, there are a lot of other people with circumstances that make learning a bit harder. But I'm talking about just a regular person, uh, no issues, um, no, no particular special needs. I will end my sharing with you. Um, difficult maths problem don't make me cry because you've got other things to worry about. Uh, when you're all by yourself, all alone, 500 miles away from home. Um, so I, I was in Singapore alone, 12 years old, and we just live in some hostel. Not really a hostel. It's the closed down Nanyang University. In 1980, we just, we just uh, lived there. No one takes care of us. We take care of ourselves. We take care of everything, basically. 
Um, these are some of my friends. So now you know how old I am, but I gotta work it out. The sum of the ages of the old men is 138 years, more than the sum of the ages of the boys. All but one of the old men are in the 1981 photograph. How many years apart were this photograph taken? Uh, that was taken just before I left. So that one I can tell you. I told you, right? I, I left when I was 12 years old. Anyway, it's a maths problem. Um, those are some of my junior college and secondary school friends. Um, I don't think I went to school to learn literature or to learn maths. But I went to school to learn to work with other people, to learn to deal with disappointment. Because sometimes the maths test is so difficult, they take your marks, they square root it, they times, they times 10 to get your actual score. Because everyone did so badly. It's so embarrassing. And for prelim, it wouldn't do. Because you need the marks to get to a JC. But the exam is so hard. They have to square root your marks times 10. Square root times 10 is a good formula. Because you get 100, you still get 100. <laughs> you get zero, you still get zero. <laughs> but everything else in between will be moderated. So the exam was so difficult. But we don't cry. We're just like, oh, too bad we cannot do it. Like, let's see what happens. And life goes on, right? And, and these are some of the awesome people I met along the way. People at Pathlight, Denise initially, Xiaomei and Linda eventually. Uh, these are people who have been around for a long time and I think they are really, really hardworking leaders. Um, and, and I'm there because of them. Likewise, Anglo-Singapore International School in Bangkok, about the same time, I, I met Denise, I met the husband and wife who started this school. And I can see that they are really passionate about it, but they have no clue what to do. They were doing worksheets. I said, you can't run an international school like that. Nobody will come. It's not the way of learning. They have all kind of imagination because they're not educators. Uh, what, what education is? They thought Singapore education is just doing worksheet. Uh, so I don't know, you, you cannot do that. You do that, you'll be behind. And today, uh, they have three campuses. Yeah, they started as a house, just like Path Light. Um, I met this lady, she passed away last year, um, Mary Lou. Mm, she started a school before I was born. I'm 51 years old, so quite a long time ago. And when, when she passed away, she left a will. And the will say that uh, you must leave some money for Singapore Mets program at St. Edward's School. She believed in it so much that even on her deathbed, she thinks it's so important that, that her colleagues in the school she started must be supported to teach mathematics in a certain way. Um, another lady who passed away recently from cancer, um, I know her quite well because she is really enthusiastic about bringing this method to her school. And she got cancer some years back, and I drew Spikey for her. Not because of Spikey, but she kind of recovered after that. Uh, but unfortunately, suddenly she passed away uh, this year. And just before she passed away, she arranged for me to go back to her school for training uh, next year. And this is from her obituary. And, and she, she left word to, to say that it's quite important uh, in her obituary to mention about the maths program in her school. So I did write a little note uh, to the family, and I, these are the words I said. This is one of the most dedicated people I, I know, and having done everything in her power to bring an awesome math program, uh, build an awesome team. Um, Kalau, Hawaii, she's retired now. She is very ill. But even in her illness, she made all those things. And she brought it to my workshop. And so as not to interrupt my workshop, she left it outside. I wanted to meet her. You know, I would have stopped the class just to chat with her. She was so ill that she actually couldn't get out of her house. But she made that trip. 
she wanted to give this to the participants to encourage them to attend the course. She was every day on the Facebook writing things to remind teachers in Hawaii to attend the course. And said, you come to the course. I'm making this for you guys. There'll be five sets for you to bring home. Sign up for the course. Sign up for her course. She's ill, and on top of that, um, she's taking care of her husband, who is much older, uh, who has um, dementia as well. Uh, dementia. So, you know. So these are people that I think, they, they are so passionate about what they do that it just struck me like, these are very nice people to work with. A lot of the people I meet are, are children. These are Spanish children. I taught them in English. They responded in Spanish. <laughs> the class was covered by the newspaper. Uh, the newspaper headline was, uh, the teacher went in with two glasses in his hand and left by signing autograph like a football star. <laughs> uh, this boy is only primary one. He attended the training with the parents. He's so small, I didn't know he was there. Apparently, during the course, he keep on wanting to answer questions. But because he's so small, I couldn't see him. So during the break, he came up to me to explain all his solution. He's only primary one. He could do all the things that the, the teachers were doing, which is obviously up to primary six. So I'm quite amazed. that. Um, and, and the mother told me that he play with numbers as if they are toys. So this is just to share with you a few people that I met which are pretty awesome. All right, thank you very much for listening.